Good evening, welcome to UC Berkeley and the spring 2014 Horace M. Albright Lecture in Conservation with Professor Jared Diamond. I'm Keith Gillis, Dean of the College of Natural Resources and a professor of forest economics here. Uh, before we begin, um, let's take a minute to make sure that uh, our technology is quiet technology. Um, and I'd like to ask you, please, uh, no photography or recording during uh, the presentation. Uh, it's totally unnecessary. We are taping this event, and it'll be available in much better sound and visual quality on the website within a few days. Um, there will be uh, time for some questions and answers uh, at the end of Professor Diamond's presentation. Uh, since we have such a large audience, uh, we wanna make the most of the time that we have for question and answer, so we're asking you to please write your questions clearly on one of the index cards that our ushers are collecting and distributing. If you have a question, you haven't done so already, please uh, uh, raise your hand and the ushers will make sure you get a card and they'll be collecting them. Um, that's it for housekeeping and logistics, on to the whole reason we're really here, which is not housekeeping and logistics. So, for over 50 years, the Albright Lecture Series has brought to Berkeley some of the most thought-provoking and innovative leaders in conservation and sustainability. Uh, the series today is a marvelous tribute to Horace Albright and his lifetime of achievement. As many of you probably know, given that we are a self-selected crowd, uh, when we attend events like this, Horace Albright is the person to whom we probably all owe the greatest collective debt for the creation of the National Park Service. Uh, we're delighted to partner this evening uh, on the lecture with two very important programs that are keeping the legacy of Horace Albright alive. Uh, the Master of Development Practice, which is celebrating the graduation of its first cohort of students, and the Department of Environmental Science Policy and Management, which is celebrating its 20th anniversary. Uh, the Master of Development Practice, or MDP, as we say in an institution that loves to speak in acronyms, uh, is a two-year degree program that provides students with the skills and knowledge required to better identify and address the global challenges of sustainable development, uh, such as poverty, population, health, conservation, climate change, agricultural productivity. Uh, the MDP students that are here tonight, uh, a great group, and their uh, orientation to solving those issues really resonates, I believe, with what our speaker is saying to us tonight. Uh, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation committed more than $15 million to create a network of uh, MDP programs at 20 universities worldwide, and Berkeley is very honored to have been selected as a part of that network of MDP programs uh, because it helps us, in part, realize our aspirations to increase our engagement in professionally oriented graduate education in the areas where our faculty have a long history of both doing research and engaging and practice. Uh, the MDP program here wouldn't be possible without the dedication and capable leadership of my colleague, the distinguished agricultural economist and Robinson Professor of Agriculture and Food Economics, David Zilberman. Uh, David, would you please stand for a moment? David is the only person I've ever met that when you raise any topic can say honestly, oh, I wrote a paper, and he has, <laughs> on anything, you name it. Uh, will all members of the Master of Development Practice uh, program in attendance tonight raise your hands? They deserve applause. They're the future leaders that are going to implement the new ideas that help us meet the challenge of sustainable development. Uh, they're going to go on from Berkeley to take on roles in global nonprofits, private enterprise, innovative startups, governments, economic and public policy think tanks, international firms. You're gonna see these people and you're gonna hear their name. Uh, our second partner in putting on tonight's event is the Department of Environmental Science Policy and Management, just so that their acronym doesn't get slighted, it's ESPM, uh, or ESPM if you care to draw it out, uh, which is celebrating its 20th anniversary. It was formed in 1994 as we were thinking, what makes us relevant and well poised to exploit our position on the Berkeley campus to address a mission uh, which we feel is the modern land-grant mission. Uh, 
Uh, the Q&A session tonight will be moderated by the chair of that department, Professor Ron Amundsen. Ron, would you stand up for a second and so they can see? I think the work that is going to be discussed uh, this evening by the speaker really epitomizes the work done by our students and faculty in the MDP program and ESPM and the College of Natural Resources more generally. Uh, Professor Diamond's latest book, uh, The World Until Yesterday, shows the importance of development experts being students of both science and customs, tradition and history of the traditional cultures in which they work. Uh, they need essentially to be engaged in a continuous co-learning process with the cultures that they work with. As I told Professor Diamond earlier today, it wasn't until I was actually engaged in sustainable development work as a professional that I fully understood the wisdom of one of my major professors uh, having me read a lot of cultural anthropology. Economists need to know this. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to, to welcome to the Spring Albright uh, scientist and author Jared Diamond. Uh, I think everyone in this audience must know uh, at least one, probably several of his popular science books, The Third Chimpanzee, uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel, uh, for which he received a Pulitzer Prize in 1998, Collapse, and the focus of his talk tonight, his book, The World Until Yesterday. Originally trained in physiology, Diamond's work draws from a wide variety of fields, including anthropology, ecology, geography, evolutionary biology. In addition to his Pulitzer Prize, Diamond received a National uh, Science Medal in 1999, and in 2013, the prestigious Wolf Prize in Agriculture, which those of us in agricultural economics would call the Nobel Prize in Agriculture, uh, for his pioneering work on theories of crop domestication, the rise of agriculture and its influences on the development and demise of human societies, as well as its impact on the ecology of the environment. Born in Boston, Diamond obtained his BA from Harvard, his PhD uh, in physiology from Cambridge. Uh, Diamond returned to Harvard, then moved on to become a professor of physiology at the UCLA Medical School in 68. While still in his 20s, he developed a parallel career in ornithology and ecology, specializing in New Guinea and nearby islands, uh, which was a part of the topic of discussion from Professor Bisinger, uh, another ornithologist on our faculty, uh, when they had a chance to reconnect earlier this evening. Uh, later in his 50s, Diamond developed a third career in environmental history and became professor of geography at UCLA, where he is today. Please join me in welcoming Professor Jared Diamond to the podium. Let me first check whether you can hear me OK in back. Can you hear it back? More technology. Now can you hear in back? Can you hear? Yes. No. <laughs> Is there someone controlling the microphone who can push it up a few amps? Now can you hear? Can you hear in back? Yes. yes, all right. It's a pleasure for me to be back at Berkeley. I grew up in Boston. I had never been to California until just about 50 years ago when I made my first trip to California. It was to Berkeley. I stayed in the faculty club, and I decided then that I wanted to move to California. <laughs> the only missing element was job negotiations, and the result of those was that I moved to UCLA in 1966 to the medical school where for many years, for 36 years, I was a specialist in gallbladder sodium transport, I taught medical students about gallbladder, intestine, and kidney. And finally, in 2002, I moved to our college, to the geography department, where I now teach just undergraduates. 
and that gives me an opportunity to write books about big questions of human societies and to try out the material for books on my UCLA undergraduates. <laughs> Yesterday, I was giving a lecture in what will be my next book to come out in four or five years. I find that teaching undergraduates is a quick way to discover whether or not what I'm saying will interest an educated audience, whether or not I'm explaining in a way that they can understand, and whether I understand it at all myself. <laughs> so it's wonderful to teach undergraduates. My most recent book was about traditional societies. I've been working on the island of New Guinea since 1964, studying birds, and in the process, to do anything in New Guinea, including to study birds, you have to be with New Guineans, who are wonderful, interesting people, members of so-called traditional societies. All of us here today are accustomed to living in big industrial societies, so that we are accustomed to permanent housing, a centralized government to make decisions, writing and books, and the internet, societies where most people live past age 70, and where we are accustomed to meeting strangers and not freaking out or getting killed, as is the case this evening. I have not noticed anyone yet trying to kill me, and I assure you that I have not tried to kill anyone. But if this were a traditional society, where one is not accustomed to dealing with strangers, being with strangers is a scary experience. We forget that all of those things, living in permanent housing, centralized government, not having to deal with strangers, all of those things arose very recently in human history. Humans have constituted a distinct evolutionary line, separate from the evolutionary line of chimpanzees, for about six million years. But almost all of those things that I mentioned, dealing with strangers, eating food grown by other people, living in permanent housing, having centralized governments, all of those things didn't exist anywhere in the world 11,000 years ago. They arose only within the last 11,000 years, and some of them, such as the internet and the phenomenon of most people living past age 70, developed only within the last century or so. That is, the ancestors of all of us here today were living under traditional conditions until virtually yesterday, measured against the time scale, the six million year time scale of human evolution. Until 500 years ago, traditional tribal societies still occupied large parts of the world. But tribal societies have recently been coming under increasing pressure from modern societies with state governments to the point where today, the last tribal societies not yet under state control are confined to small areas of New Guinea and of the Amazon basin. Those tribal societies, which constituted all human societies for most of human history, are far more diverse than are our modern big societies. All big societies that have governments, and where most people are strangers to each other, are similar to each other and different from tribal societies in many basic ways, regardless of whether the big societies are American, Chinese, Japanese, or Israeli. Tribes constitute thousands of natural experiments in how to run a human society. They constitute experiments from which we ourselves may be able to learn. For example, if today you think that modern American children enjoy too much freedom or else are not given enough freedom, you cannot perform the decisive experiment of designating 17 American states where children will be given the freedom to do whatever they want, including to play with sharp knives from the age of two, and designate another 17 states where children have to remain strictly subservient to their parents and grandchildren, grandparents, and then 16 other states where children continue to be treated as they are today. If we could only carry out that controlled experiment, we could come back in 40 years, compare the kids from those three sets of states, compare kids with less, more, and equal freedom, and quickly settle whether American children 
would be better off with less, more, or the same freedom that they have today. Unfortunately, it's impossible, immoral, and illegal to carry out that decisive experiment in the United States. But there are thousands of traditional societies in which children already grow up with either much more freedom or much less freedom than in the modern US. By examining what actually does happen to children in traditional societies that are much more varied than modern American society, we may be able to learn things of practical value to us, practical value in deciding how to raise our own kids, how to treat older people, how to remain healthy, how to deal with danger, and other things that we care a lot about. Tribal society should not be scorned as primitive and miserable, but also they shouldn't be idealized as happy and peaceful. When we learn of tribal practices, some of them will horrify us, but there are other tribal practices which, when we hear about them, we may admire and envy them, and we may wonder whether we could adopt those practices for ourselves. The example of tribal practices that I wanted to discuss this evening is something of practical interest to all of us, namely how to deal with danger. And to illustrate issues of dealing with danger, let me begin with an incident that happened to me in New Guinea in my early years there. I was studying birds, surveying birds with a group of New Guineans on a mountain, and we were moving our camp from low elevation up to high elevation on the mountain. And in the afternoon, we arrived at a suitable altitude. I picked what I thought would be a gorgeous campsite. It was underneath a magnificent tall tree at a flat place in the ridge where I would have plenty of space for bird watching. The ridge had a sharp drop off where I'd be able to look out and watch swifts and parrots and hawks fly by. And so I told the New Guineans with me, let's camp out here and could you please put up our tents underneath this big tree. At that time, I was inexperienced and incautious about the specific dangers of New Guinea, and I didn't have New Guineans' general attitude towards danger. To me, that tree seemed perfectly safe to sleep under, but not to my New Guinea friends. They refused to sleep there. They said, rather than sleep under that tree, they were gonna move 100 yards down the ridge and even sleep out in the open. And I asked, what's, what's the matter with sleeping under this tree? They said, look at it, the tree is dead. And yes, I looked up at it and yeah, the tree was dead, but for heaven's sakes, it's a gigantic tree, I said, that's been standing there for decades and it's gonna stand there for another decade and it's not decades and it's not going to fall over on us and kill us precisely tonight while we're camped out under it. So for heaven's sakes, let's put up our tents underneath this beautiful tree. But my New Guinea friends absolutely refused to sleep there. I thought that their fears were exaggerated, veering on paranoia, which is the technical term for exaggerated fear. <laughs> well, as I got more experience in New Guinea, it was the case that we spent a week there, and in the week the tree, I slept under the tree, the New Guineans slept further away, and the tree did not fall over on me during that week, so I thought that proves that the fears are paranoid and, and I was behaving appropriately. But as I got more experience in New Guinea, Every night that you sleep out in New Guinea forest, you hear a tree fall somewhere. And as you walk around in New Guinea forest during the day, every now and then during the day, you hear trees falling somewhere in the forest. And eventually I did the calculation. If the risk of a dead tree falling on you, the particular night that you choose to sleep under it is only one in 1,000, which sounds like nothing. But if you sleep every night under a dead tree, then within three years, which is 1,095 nights, if your risk of the tree falling over on you per night is one in 1,000, you can expect to be dead within three years <laughs> if you have the bad habit of sleeping under dead trees. The paranoia, the apparent paranoia of the New Guineans then made perfect sense to me. I now think of it as constructive paranoia. That's to say a watchful outlook essential to survival in traditional societies. And that's the most important lesson that I've learned from New Guineans about dealing with danger. Uh, namely, the 
cumulative risk of repeatedly doing something that each time you do it, your chances of encountering disaster are low, but if you repeat it often enough, the chances will catch up with you. The cautious attitude towards danger that I've learned from my New Guinea friends drives many of my American friends crazy. The Americans who understand my, the Americans and Europeans who understand my attitude towards danger are friends who've li whose lifestyle exposes them repeatedly to danger and who learned, as did I, from seeing the deaths of incautious friends. One was a friend who was an unarmed Bobby on the streets of London. Another is a whitewater rafting guide in the United States. And a third is a friend who pilots small airplanes. And all of them learned constructive paranoia by seeing what happened to other pilots and, and other guides and other policemen who were not equally cautious. Obviously, there have to be big differences between how one thinks about dangers in New Guinea and other traditional societies on the one hand, compared to how we think about dangers in the US. For example, the types of dangers are of course different. In New Guinea and other traditional societies, the principal dangers include accidents of the natural environment, such as lions, dangerous insects, falling trees, and exposure to cold or rain. Those environmental hazards are much less important in the West where we've tamed and modified the natural environment. Nevertheless, my wife and I were nearly killed by a falling tree in Montana last year. Other dangers of traditional life are violence, infectious diseases, and starvation. All of those are much less significant as threats in the West. Instead, we face a new set of dangers, such as cars, stepladders, heart attacks, cancers, and other non-communicable diseases. So partly we've just traded one set of dangers, of traditional dangers, for another new set of modern dangers. But it's not just the case that the types of dangers in the US differ from the types of dangers in New Guinea. The overall level of danger, the risk of death each year, is lower in Western society, as measured by our average lifespan of nearly 80 years compared to 50 years or less in traditional societies. And a third difference is that the consequences of accidents can be repaired much more easily in the US than in New Guinea. For example, my only broken leg bone in my life came when I slipped on the ice in Harvard Square in Cambridge, Mass. I stumbled over to a telephone booth 10 feet away called up my physician father, who came and picked me up, took me to the hospital where the surgeons set my foot, and I got fixed completely. Whereas if you break a leg bone in New Guinea, when you are three days walk away from the nearest airstrip, the odds are against you of being able to get out to the airstrip at all. And also in traditional societies, there are not surgeons to set a broken bone, so you're likely to end up crippled for the rest of your life. Hence, we in the West are not so concerned about dangers because even if an accident happens, we know it's much more likely to be fixable for us than if it happened in New Guinea. That lower level of danger in the modern world, combined with our expectation that damage caused by dangers can be repaired, has consequences for our thinking about danger in the modern world. Our thinking is muddled, and confused. We obsess about the wrong risks. We worry too much about dangers that really are very unlikely to befall us and that kill vanishingly few Americans. And conversely, we don't pay enough attention to the dangers that really are likely to materialize. We Americans obsess about terrorists and plane crashes while we brush off the danger of falling while coming up a steep Berkeley stair or falling while on, a, while on a step ladder. Our confused thinking about dangers emerges from comparing our ratings of various hazards compared with the numbers of actual deaths or potential deaths caused by those same hazards. There's big discrepancy. But in such comparisons, you have to be careful 
The number of actual deaths caused by a particular type of hazard may not be a good measure of the seriousness of that hazard. The hazard's number of resulting deaths may be low precisely because the hazard crops up frequently and it's likely to be fatal, and we recognize it and take precautions against it. In that case, the hazard has a big influence on our behavior. We're very careful about it. It changes our lifestyle, and as a result, it causes few deaths. An example of that effect in traditional societies arises among the Kung people, hunter-gatherers of southern Africa, with regard to lions. The Kung live in deserts where there are lots of lions. Lions, nevertheless, cause very few Kung deaths. Only five out of every thousand Kung deaths is due to a lion. Does that mean that lions are not dangerous? No, of course not. Lions cause few Kung deaths precisely because lions are so dangerous and they're encountered so frequently that the Kung are extremely careful about them and they make big changes in their, be their behavior to reduce the hazard of lions. To avoid lions, the Kung don't go out at night. During the day, they walk around in groups rather than singly. They talk constantly so that the noise will alert a lion and they won't surprise and stumble on a lion. And they keep their eyes out for animal tracks. An example for us moderns of a real and recognized danger causing few deaths precisely because some of us recognize it and adopt countermeasures involves experienced airplane pilots who do a lot of flying. Airplane pilots know perfectly well that their mistakes are likely to be fatal. And so every time that they're about to fly an airplane, they go around the plane and they check it out carefully. In contrast, most of us, when we get into a rental car or when we get into our own car, we don't go around the car and check it carefully because mistakes or structural problems are much less likely to kill you when driving a car than when piloting an airplane. So you can't simply take the number of deaths caused by a hazard as a measure of the seriousness and frequency of the hazard. You have to estimate what the number of deaths would be if you were not careful. But even when you take that consideration into account, there's still a big mismatch between our subjective ranking of risks and the actual seriousness of risks. It turns out that the hazards that we Americans rank highly are the hazard of terrorists, plane crashes for passengers, nuclear accidents, DNA-based technologies, genetically modified crops, and spray cans. Though, in fact, all of those things kill very, very few Americans. Conversely, we Americans underestimate the hazards of alcohol, cars, smoking, slipping and falling, and home appliances, all of which do kill lots of people. What things are shared between hazards that we overestimate and what things are shared between hazards that we underestimate? It turns out that we overestimate the danger of hazards that lie beyond our control and we overestimate the hazard of things about which we have no choice and events that kill many people at a time and hazards that kill people in visible, spectacular ways that make newspaper headlines and new unfamiliar risks such as DNA. That's why we overestimate the hazards of terrorists, nuclear accidents, plane crashes for passengers, and DNA-based technologies. Those dangers happen to us and we can't control them. Conversely, we underestimate the hazards of events that are under our control, things that we choose or accept voluntarily, things that kill only one individual at a time in ways that don't make newspaper headlines, and familiar hazards. That's why we underestimate the danger of drinking alcohol, cars, smoking, slipping and falling, and home appliances. We choose to use or do those things, and we think that we can limit the risks of them by being careful. We underestimate those hazards because the average person thinks, I know that those things can kill other people, but I am careful, 
and their risk for me is lower than their risk for the average person. But that's obviously nonsense because by definition, the average person who is saying that faces average risks. We tend to think, I am careful and strong. So those things may kill other people, but they are unlikely to kill me. That attitude is summed up by the quip, we are reluctant to let others do unto us that which we happily do unto ourselves. <laughs> the really serious hazards of everyday life about which we should obsess much more than we obsess about terrorists and GM crops and nuclear technology include the danger of slipping and falling in the shower or slipping and falling on a wet sidewalk or on a stepladder or while going down the stairs. All that you have to do is to read the obituary column any day in any newspaper and you'll see that for older people, falls are one of the commonest causes of getting crippled, loss of quality of life, and even of getting killed. With that in mind, I reflect that today I've already done the most dangerous thing that I'm gonna do all day today. Namely, I took a shower. <laughs> you may say, for heaven's sakes, Jared, you are paranoid. <laughs> what is the risk, Jared, of falling in the shower? It's only one in 1,000. What are you so obsessed about? And my answer is one in 1,000, risk of falling in the shower, one in 1,000. That's not nearly good enough. Just do the numbers. Now that I'm 76, life expectancy for an American man age 76 is 91. So I have statistically 15 remaining years of average life expectancy. But if I shower daily in those 15 years, <laughs> I'm gonna take 15 times 365 equals 5,475 showers. And if every time I take a shower, I'm so incautious that my risk of falling in the shower is one in 1,000, then it means that by the time I live out my, what would otherwise be my life expectancy of age 91, I'm gonna kill myself five and a half times. <laughs> That's why I've learned to pay attention to the risk of dangers that carry only a low risk each time that I do them, but that I expect to do frequently for the rest of my life, such as taking showers and driving. Like New Guineans who expect to sleep out in the jungle many or most nights for the rest of their life. There are some people who object that my attitude of caution that I learned from New Guineans must be paralyzing. Some of my friends think that I'm always obsessing about what could go wrong, and so the result is that I don't do anything. No, the fact is, instead I operate with constructive paranoia like New Guineans. Despite the hazards of falling trees, New Guineans still do camp out in the forest, but they're careful never to camp out under a dead tree. And similarly, I assure you, I do not avoid taking showers. I still do take my daily shower, but I pay attention and I do it carefully. I'm concerned about showers. You may have noticed that I watched as I came up these stairs. I'm concerned about step ladders. I'm concerned about cars, but I'm not at all concerned about terrorists, nuclear accidents, GM crops, and other bagatelles like that. That then is one example of the lessons that one can learn from observing the lifestyle of people in traditional societies. And it's one of the examples that I've most incorporated into my own life. But there are many other areas where we can watch how people live in traditional societies and learn things that are valuable to us about how to deal with universal human problems. All people, whether they're in industrial societies or traditional, all people are likely to have children, to grow old, to face dangers, to get involved in disputes, to think about religion, possibly to speak more than one language. Traditional people have faced those same problems. They've had tens of thousands of years of figuring out thousands of different ways of dealing with those problems. For example, Dispute resolution in traditional societies emphasizes emotional clearance. It doesn't focus on right or wrong. It doesn't focus on how much that pig is worth. It instead recognizes the fact that 
you're going to deal with that person for the rest of your life. And what counts is being able to deal with that person and not having your relationship poisoned. Well, in, in our modern industrial societies, some of the disputes, any of you who've been in court, uh, know that American courts routinely uh, make, do not attempt at all to achieve emotional closure between the individuals involved in a civil dispute or in a criminal dispute. What American courts care about is right and wrong, punishment, and setting a good example. And so any of you who've had the misfortune to appear in court with someone that potentially you're going to deal with for the rest of your life, such as any of you who've been in a divorce court, or any of you who've had an inheritance dispute with a brother or sister, you know that the American courts are likely to produce the result that certainly there's no emotional clearance, but instead you're likely to end up angry and not speaking to brother, sister, ex-spouse for the rest of your life. But traditional societies, we can learn from traditional societies uh, about how to deal with the disputes aiming at emotional closure. That's one example. And in fact, there's a movement in California, New Zealand, Canada, and so on uh, to bring together the advantages of modern state-level societies with their courts, combined with the emphasis of traditional societies on emotional closure. It's called restorative justice. Another example is child rearing. Um, and I speak with some diffidence about what I learned from traditional societies about child rearing, given that one of my two sons is in the audience today. Uh, but the, the fact is that in traditional societies, uh, children are brought up to be self-confident, to be socially skilled already at five, ten years, to make their own decisions. Where does that come from? Well, there are things done in traditional societies bringing up children which are not standard practice in modern state-level societies. Um, tradition, in in small-level traditional societies, for example, among the pygmies of Africa, absolutely never do you hit a child or a baby. Um, if a husband or wife hits a child once, that's considered grounds for divorce. In traditional societies, babies are carried. They're not pushed in baby carriages horizontally, where they can't see where they're going. They're not carried vertically facing backwards, where they can't see where they're going. They're carried vertically facing forwards, where they do see where they're going, where they've got the same field of view as the parent and so where they feel in control of their environment, and the result is faster development of neuromotor skills. In traditional societies, usually there's a quicker response to a child crying, to a, to a baby crying. There's much debate um, in modern societies about whether if a baby cries, should you pick the baby up, or should you let the baby cry itself to sleep? even if it takes half an hour. Well, there's none of that nonsense in traditional society. If a baby starts crying, on the average, the baby is picked up and comforted within less than 10 seconds and on an average within three seconds. All of those things contribute to the self-confidence and the security with which children in traditional societies grow up. Another example has to do with the evolution of religion. Um, religion assumes different functions in different societies. Religion has had different functions in the past, in really small-scale traditional societies, in early state-level societies, and in modern times. And most of us in our lives go through a religious crisis where we reevaluate our religion or reevaluate whether to have a religion at all. Under those circumstances, it may be helpful to look at what religion has meant in other societies and to realize that religion is not monolithic. It doesn't just have a single function, but it serves different functions for different people at different times. Another example involves multilingualism. In the United States, multilingualism, that's to say, growing up, children growing up speaking multiple languages, um, is not just controversial, but a prevalent view in the United States is that <laughs> children should not be brought up, should not be confused, being brought up as babies learning multiple languages, because the concern is that, that it will be confusing for kids and you should teach kids just one language. But the reality, and learn another language later when you go to Berkeley or high school, <laughs> but the reality is that in traditional societies around the world, most kids 
grow up learning multiple languages. In New Guinea, I personally have never met a New Guinean who spoke fewer than five languages because mother and father are likely to come from different language groups. The median New Guinea language is spoken only by 2,000 people. So other groups around you speak different languages. And the result is that you learn the language of your mother, and you learn the language of your father, and you learn other languages around you. Perhaps the most, in fact, the most surprising discovery that I made in the course of work on this recent book, The World Until Yesterday, had to do with the benefits of multilingualism. A study within the last five years in Toronto, Canada, in old people's homes, um, looked at the onset of symptoms of the dreaded dementias of old age, such as Alzheimer's disease. And in old people's home in, in Toronto, the onset of symptoms of Alzheimer's, if they came on at all, was measured in a wide variety of subjects, and different things were measured about the subjects. And it turned out, in the case of Alzheimer's, there's speculation that you can protect yourself against Alzheimer's by playing bridge or by doing Sudoku puzzles. But in fact, there's no evidence in support of any of these so-called so modern protective me measures against Alzheimer's. The only thing that we now know and discovered in the last five years that protects you against Alzheimer's symptoms is being multilingual. That's to say, in this Canadian study, people who spoke two or more languages, if they developed Alzheimer's symptoms at all, developed them on the average five years later. That's to say, being multilingual, or at least being bilingual, gives you five years protection against Alzheimer's. Why? Well, we all know that, that exercising our bodies, if you want to, for, to develop your shoulders, keep your shoulders strong. Best thing to do is shoulder exercises. But the best exercise for the human brain is being multilingual, because constantly throughout the day, every time you hear someone, or every time you talk, or every time you think, you're having to switch back and forth between a couple of sets of rules. You're having to switch back and forth between Japanese and English, or between Italian, German, and English. And so multilingualism is constant exercise for the brain. So it's, in retrospect, it's not surprising that multilingualism is the only protection that we know now against the symptoms of Alzheimer's. What we don't know is whether a multilingual person seems, achieves the same benefit as a bilingual person whether you get five years for a second language <laughs> and no, no more years of protection against multiple languages, or whether you get five years for each language. And this is something of much interest to me because what will be the last language that I learn, my 13th language, is Italian. And if I get five years protection for each language, then I've got 65 years of protection against Alzheimer's. Whereas if you get five years of protection for being bilingual and no further protection for other languages, then I've only got five years of benefits. <laughs> Research is still waiting on that. And finally, from traditional societies, um, we can learn about being healthy. Um, the majority, the vast majority of us in this room are going to die of a so-called non-communicable disease. That's to say a non-infectious disease like type 2 diabetes, stroke, hypertension, heart disease, cancer. In traditional societies, essentially nobody dies of those non-communicable diseases. And yet if people in traditional societies adopt a Western lifestyle, such as New Guinea villagers moving down to the capital, Port Moresby, and starting to eat out of supermarkets, within a, sh within a relatively short time, they, the people in traditional society, start developing these non-communicable diseases, such as type 2 diabetes and heart disease. So it's clear that something about the traditional lifestyle protects us against non-communicable diseases. We already know a good deal about what are the factors in our lifestyle that get us in trouble, and what are the factors in traditional lifestyles that protect us. Salt intake is one. Traditional salt intake in the highlands of New Guinea is 1 20th of a gram of salt per day. The average American consumes 10 grams of salt per day, which means that the average American in one day consumes as much salt as a New Guinean in 200 days. There's a Asian restaurant in Orange County, east of Los Angeles, which has the record for one dish. Its spicy noodle dish contains 18 grams of salt, which is one year's worth of salt consumption for a New Guinean. So given what we know about the relation between salt and blood pressure and hypertension and stroke, it's no surprise that our modern lifestyle predisposes us towards 
hypertension and stroke, and the traditional lifestyle protects against it. Or diabetes, again, risk factors for type 2 diabetes are eating too much and eating the wrong um, types of stuff, eating too much sugar, um, eating, uh, uh, eating too much of the wrong sorts of fats. Um, but the risk of diabetes in type 2 diabetes in New Guinea is essentially zero. It's a matter of lifestyle. So those then are some examples, examples from confronting danger, examples from dispute resolution, examples from rearing children, examples from religion, examples from multilingualism, and examples from staying healthy. Those are just some examples of what we can learn from traditional societies. I hope that you'll find it as fascinating to read in my book about traditional societies as I found it to live in them. Thank you. So I was joking uh, with someone earlier at the reception uh, about the way I teach sustainability for years as I was teaching the introduction to environmental economics and policy on the campus here. And I said I'd start my last lecture off with short film clips from original Star Trek, Woody Allen's Sleeper, um, Soya and Green, and Mad Max, and uh, asked the students then as we talked about different ideas as to what even a sustainable future might look like, where at this point, after just talking about sustainability and economics with me for a semester, they thought society was headed. And no one ever picked original Star Trek uh, with, with Kirk holding up a large diamond saying, well, I can make as many of these as I want up on the ship. Um, you know, so unlimited resources. Not a future anyone believes in, right? Um, so I, I hope as you're going home tonight, you think a bit uh, about what sustainability is, what our futures might be, and where we might look for inspiration to achieve it. And the other thing is, uh, based on your, your comments tonight, uh, I have two choices when I'm going back to the city. I've got my Spanish language CDs loaded in my car, and, and I've got the radio. and. I think I know which, which my option is going to be on the drive back to San Francisco. Thank you very much, Professor Diamond, for a stimulating talk. Um, thank, thank you, Ron, for helping us with the discussion, and thank you to the audience. As always, a Berkeley crowd asks good questions. Thank you.